this week on Dig Me Out. With your hosts, Jason Zia and Tim Minichi. Jay, we're back again with another episode thanks to our Dig Me Out Union on Patreon. You can help us make the next episode happen by joining us at dmounion.com or digmeoutunion.com. Jay, this episode is one that is shaped and molded by the union. <laughs> okay. I, That's a it's like strange a, way to put it's it. It's like a piece of clay and it is formed into a pot of music. I don't like know what ghost. any of that means. Like ghost, exactly. All three I, of our hands I'm, are on it. All hands. In an embrace. In an embrace. Uh, we are embracing Mr. Chris Martz. Welcome back after a, a hiatus. Yes, a, a life hiatus, I guess you can call it. He did well. So last year you had a pick, but you were you were on the trail. Uh, so that was, I believe, Wicker Man, which uh, yes. Mm -hmm. But you've this is uh, amongst the many that you have brought to us over the your picks over the recent years have been Season to Risk, Taf Cafe to Cuba, um, Far, and Brainiac. Uh, that's from the last five years plus you've joined us for some roundtables on kiss and warp tour and tribute albums so that's a that's a diverse number of records there uh from brainiac to cafe to cuba the season of risk that's got some there's no uh there's no um particular theme so the audience should be on their toes when it comes to this episode can you share with them what your pick is for 2022? Yeah, kind of keeping with that eclectic theme, I chose Skeleton Keys. I guess those records? Sure was. Capitol Records, Fantastic Spikes Through Balloon from 1997. Their only major label album. Yes. How did you uh, come across this record? So I was familiar with the name Skeleton Key back in the 90s, but it's just one of those bands that I never, never decided to listen to, um, never went out and picked up the CD for any reason, because I never heard it anywhere. Um, and then it was one of those bands, like I think we talked about on the Season to Risk episode, where you'd see them in the, in the show listings all the time, like, oh, Season to Risk is playing here, yeah. or Skeleton Key is playing here, and like I never saw them. Um, but I remember seeing them touring with like Helmet and for some reason, Bark Market comes to mind, I believe. Uh, so I was like, OK, they're probably pretty heavy, but I never listened to them until my brother got the CD. And I was kind of surprised, like, oh, this is what they sound like. This is not what I expected at all. So kind of surprising, but they they fit. I, I kind of have like a place where i fit them into a scene so hopefully it's kind of it's correct where i put them but they have some contemporaries i think that we all kind of listen to as well now do you have the cd i do um do you have the hole punched version okay so that's why so i i'm, I'm staying over at my brother's house because he's on his honeymoon right now and i'm watching his cats so i sent away for a copy of it on eBay. And I was like, okay, get in preparation, because I think I told you guys you should get it. So this the copy that I got is this one right here. But mm -hmm. this is great audio content for the podcast people. But there are no <laughs> there's no holes in it. He is opening the booklet. There's there's no holes punched out in it. Interesting. And I was kind of disappointed with it. I don't know if this is a promo copy or yes. what the deal is. Uh so from what I read. The promo copies were not hole punched, but Jay, if you noticed all those holes yeah. in the actual like for sale version, there are holes going through every single layer of the. So one of the good things about staying at my brother's house is I, I went down in the basement and I found his copy. There it is. Oh, with nice. all of the holes in it. Nice. Yeah. Which is, it's pretty crazy. 
but uh, this album actually was nominated for a Grammy for its packaging. I don't, that's one of the most unique things that I remember about this record is just opening up the book and like, why are there these holes in it everywhere? It looks somebody, like at, somebody at the label was, uh, are you serious? You really want to do this? Do you know how much <laughs> this is going to cost? Yeah, exactly. To do a nine by nine grid of 81 holes. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Five, yeah. 81 holes on each one. Yeah. Yep. Well, I did the math. Oh, yeah. And I know nine times nine because I have a nine year old and she was working on her math problems this year. And I helped her. And it might have helped me too. Let's be honest. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, Jay, were you familiar with this at all? No, not at all. I mean, I like Chris, the name was familiar. I mean, it's a full band name. <laughs> too that doesn't hurt but i had no idea what they sounded like did you have or, an inkling like when you looked at the band name the album title a little bit artwork. when i looked at the album t- uh, cover i got a little bit of a vibe is that a sausage i think so but just the composition and the holes it gave me kind of a i don't know this is going to be slightly artistic, like maybe in Brainiac space, like it's going to be unique. And, but other than that, got it. Uh, I had no other clue. How about you? I remembered the name and I think I remember the album cover from the radio station. Um, I did feel like this was out, you know, amongst a billion other CDs from the major labels in, in 97, 96, 98, that, that era of just a ton of cds coming in for in my mind at first i was like oh this must be heavy because i was thinking like like season risk and far and and like those previous yeah. ones um and then for some reason right before i started listening i was like well maybe this is like weirder like six finger satellite or like one of those bands that like i never got a handle on in the 90s uh, which we reviewed recently, uh, not recently, I should say, a hundred episodes ago, Firewater, um, the Ponzi mm-hmm. Scheme album. Um, I was like, maybe this is, I think this is maybe in that category. Um, because there were so many bands that like seemed like they were going to be heavy, and then they were doing like much weirder things that I even at some point lumped in like Rocket from the Crypt with six finger satellite and some of these other bands just because like they had unusual lead singers. Yeah. And I was like, well, this isn't really heavy metal or, or metal at all, but it's still loud and, uh, and abrasive. So I'm not sure what it is. And th- and that was before I knew what like Jesus lizard was. Now I, obviously we've talked about him on the show and yeah. stuff like that. So I, I have like a better range when it comes to that stuff. Um, little bit of history because i couldn't find a ton so chris feel free to chime in if you know some more information history of the band the band's from new york city formed in 1994 it was mainly the brainchild of eric sanko who was the bass player and singer he wanted to create a sound that was quote luxurious yet affordable that was his that was his uh explanation of what skeleton key was to be so they used antique microphones they used quote unquote primitive guitars and unconventional percussion um the first release was human pincushion pincushion on dedicated records that came out in 1995 then the Skeleton Key EP in 1996 on Motel Records, which was followed by, as mentioned, your only major label day uh, record, Fantastic Spikes Through the Through Balloon, in 1997. I I don't know what Capital was thinking. Um, I know that a lot of bands were getting signed at this time, but um, not that I'm giving away any of my record or any of my you know review here, but like. 
this is a strange record for 1997 on a major label. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, I feel like there's a little bit of uh, grasping for the next Nirvana too by the end of the 90s. There were, so that you saw some bands like them and Brainiac, for example, of like, maybe yeah. this is it. Let's put some money behind these bands and see. Yeah. Maybe this weird band from Dayton. Right. Like, this, is, this is yes. unusual. <laughs> like, let's yeah, see. exactly. Um, in nine, uh, then they had a, a break for a couple years and released an e- ellipse in 2001 on exquisite corpse records. That was followed by obtainium in 2002 by Ipecac records, which makes me think of avatar because the thing they're trying to get in Avatar is called unobtainium, which is obtainium. Is that, that's unattainable. That, that it's unattainable. Never, never saw it. <laughs> you are missing out. No, on some very good 3D effects. No, that's, that's about it. <laughs> sorry, I, I remember when it came out. Everybody hyped it up, and I said, "I'm not interested." Uh, so. Jay and I went together. Oh. And watched it in 3D, and we we were like, "Holy crap! I can't believe what I'm seeing." This is Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was not exactly groundbreaking. Not amazing. Um, I did learn an interesting fact, though. Uh, recently, I was reading a book about the making of Mad Max Fury Road. Uh huh. And that that originally started in the mid 90s. That was when George Miller got the idea for what was going to be Fury Road, and it just he had to make. You had to make Happy Feet and Happy Feet 2 and Babe and Babe in the P- Babe Pig in the, in the city before mm-hmm. he could get the funding for Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> but they originally, if you've seen the movie, you know that um, the soldiers of the um, Immortan Joe, who's the leader of the bad guys, I guess you'd say, they all are painted white and they were originally going to be blue. And then so much time had passed that George Miller was like, the director, well, we can't have blue people. They were just in Avatar. (laughs) So they were shooting in the Namibian desert. And they said, well, everybody has to wear sunscreen because it's 115 degrees outside. What if we put them in white? Yeah. And they were like, oh, that's a good idea. They can just be painted white. So now when you watch that movie, you you just watch it and go, oh, they're just all wearing sunscreen. It's not like (laughs) like a special paint. They're just wearing (laughs) sunscreen. It kind of works. It does work, actually. Uh, in 2005, the band released the, Lion- the Lions Quintet EP on Dutel Records. And in 2012, they released Gravity is the Enemy on Arctic Recording Records, which they won an independent music award um, for best eclectic album. I don't know who gives out the independent music awards. I don't know who else that was up against or if it existed beyond the year 2013, but. Congratulations. Um, on this record, which was only released on CD, I mentioned that um, Eric Sanko played on it. Uh, Dave Sardi is one of the producers. So tying it into a previous Dig Me Out band, uh, okay. Dave Sardi yeah. of Bark Market yeah. is one of the producers on this record with the band. Um, and what was the other stuff? So do you remember, do you guys remember there was a show called Oddville on MTV? Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. briefly. This was one of the bands that played live on that show. Um, the yeah, other I, bands, saw that, I saw that clip online. So yeah, that's, and I was like, this would be a good band to play that show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The first band that played Oddville was, the, was Hanson. And then okay. you got this band. Yeah. <laughs> uh I'm not, I'm now confused what Oddville was. Thought I understood, but now I don't. It was an odd show. Uh and I mean there's nothing more odd than Hanson. Well, there's uh, there's a what's that geeky guy's name? He wore the glasses and he had like he kind of talked like this. I don't know if you remember him, but he wore the the horn rim mm-hmm. glasses too. Uh, when, yeah, I was the that? Of, when I watched this uh, clip of Skeleton Key, he introduced him. I'm like, oh, I remember that guy, but I don't remember much about the show at all. I'm sure, 
you know, it, I hope it's like remote control where if you go on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of past episodes on there. Um, so maybe that's on there, but I barely remember the show. There were 66 episodes over two years. They were 22 minute long. The, the, the guy who was the host was Rich Brown. He was also one of the producers on the show. And man, you can go and they have every episode listed on the on Wikipedia. And it is just a I mean, anybody you can think of from the 90s. I mean, they had guests that were introduced, I mean, that were interviewed, and then they had musical guests. But the like Our Lady Peace was on here, played on it. But then um like I said, like Skeleton Key and uh Bloodhound Gang, Wild Chibom- Orchid. Chibomato. Was it Girl Group? Chibomato. Uh Wild Orchid was like a pop group, I think. Sugar Ray. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Delamitri, fun. Teenage Fan Club. Yeah. Um Pretty much anybody se- selling a record in the late nineties. I was gonna say this probably is like, hey, major label money. Some A and R guys like, hey, put this uh, new band on your show because we want to sell records or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get to the poll from this episode at Patreon in a little bit, but we got some comments that I'm going to read to you. Um. Chip Midnight said, had a chance to see Skeleton Key live a few times, and the old adage about played everything but the kitchen sink could apply. So many non-instrument instruments played. Heck, they may have even had a kitchen sink as a part of the live show. Eric Sanko's solo album is really good as well. Okay. Been meaning to check, to check out this band since I purchased Enon. Uh, Enon's non-instrumental debut in 2000. I love the junk kit sound. I can only assume this will have it as well. Shall return with a verdict. I can find time to listen to it soon. And um, then asked about files because this is not streaming. Uh, Willie Dillon said, this is a pretty interesting album. It has quite a mix of sounds. Aspects remind me of Bark Market, Headstones, Red Red Meat. And who else? Who knows what else? I could do without the song All the Things I've Lost, but other than that, I don't have any real issues. I'm not sure it's going to become one of my favorites, but it's fun to listen to. John Seaman said, went with where the album only just checked it out over the weekend. It's a fun listen. Short, didn't like all the things I've lost at first, but it grew on me. Love the bass tone. Well, that's a song that's getting some attention. I wonder if anybody else will bring it up on this show, maybe. Um, Kyle Bittner said there were some interesting and eclectic elements on this album, but something just didn't click with me. I found that the sound got annoying over time. Some excellent funky guitar work though. Better EP for me. Gavin said, I really wasn't able to listen to this album. So I played the two most recent ones and enjoyed them. I hear soul coughing in the percussion and a little burning airlines in the vocal. I had this CD in my hand many times back in the day as it looks great, but I never knew what it was. So I didn't buy it. <laughs> I think I thought it was dance music. I could see that. Like, that could yeah. be the album cover of, like, a nondescript, you know, rave or EBM. But, uh, I mean, that could be a New Order album cover. It could. <laughs> well, by the way, I think that's a balloon, by the way. Is it a balloon? I, I think still it's think a it's a sausage. I don't know. It, looks, it looks like a sausage when you're looking at it close up because it's got little, like, black marks in there. So, you know, all the seasonings. the flies put- died. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And then Jeff Genta said, gave it three listens and, I, and it really improved. The intro track does not do the album favors. Vomit Ascot is a skipper. And there are a few more interesting than enjoyable, but there's enough to make it a better EP agreed on the Burning Airlines comparison. Interesting. Vomit Ascot, uh, name of <laughs> my sex tape. So Yikes. let's go. <laughs> no, thank you. No. It did not sell well, believe it or not. It sold poorly. Uh, let's get into this record. Fantastic Spikes Through Balloon by Skeleton Key. Jay, tell me one thing you liked about this album. 
Well, I'm going to start with the obvious, the percussion drum sound. Um, I watched a lot because I had, after listening to this record, I had to figure out what the hell was going on. So I watched a live group of them and there are two, there's a drummer and then there's a percussionist who's playing a mix of cans and sinks and whatever. And then he's got some toms and things. So that's really effective. It's super unique sounding. It carries a lot of kind of heft and interest so the guitars can stay pretty thin and simple. Um, there's some cool riffs, but I really think it's the percussion that's carrying this band and kind of keeping the eclectic styles they pursue here together um, so that it does sound like a largely cohesive record. You know, it sounds like the same band through the whole thing. Um, it also does the, the Dave Sardi kind of thing in the production where it's heavy, but it's not like, like big guitar heavy, you know, it's, it's the percussion and the bass tone and the aggression and the performance uh, coming together to make it heavy, in, you know, in some aspects, but in a very untraditional way. I also like, because of that percussion approach, it, it just creates more space for the music to breathe. Like you can hear everything. Uh, I think that just to make that work, you have to mix the band probably that way. And they had to figure out their tones and stuff to, to work around that, which again, adds to the super unique sound, um, particularly for a, you know, for a rock band um, at times, I, it almost borders on like a Tom Waits approach, you know, with all the weird stuff going on in the background and the, the, the percussion concept, but this is definitely a rock, rock band. Um, you know, there's a lot of different vocal approaches. Again, it's held together because, because I think the percussion, um, and I, I like that they, they can get into some stuff that sounds like, I don't want to say typical, but it sounds like alternative rock. Um, but to me, that's when it's really working the its best because it's, you know, you've got a vocal that kind of sounds like Jay Robbins and then musically you've got sounds that range anywhere from Sparkle Horse to Brainiac to Helmet. And it's this really cool fusion of bands, different styles of bands, but all kind of working together in songs like The Only Useful Word or The World's Most Famous Undertaker, Dear Reader, The Needle That Never Ends. Like they still have a somewhat familiar rock chorus but the verse will be kind of different and weird. Um, and there's some really good dynamics going on as well. So it, it sort of like they're able to do their own thing, but still be within the, you know, kind of alternative rock spectrum on those songs. was uh some of the stuff i liked what you what did you like tim well first of all I, you know the mention of burning airlines i think is real important because if you're not familiar with this music that's a great entry point i think on songs like i think it's w wide open the second track and the yeah. most famous undertaker i mean those are very j robin-esque guitar parts and vocal cadence not that it's a ripoff, it's just in that same, you know, mm -hmm. ballpark. But what's interesting is that there's little touches of of the weirdness that's happening on the rest of the record, but they give you like these okay, this is a rock song. But then you get stuff like 
all the things I've lost. Just totally not anything like that. I actually like that song because it's it's so bizarre in in the context of this record. Now, in the context of music overall, it's not that bizarre. But in the context of this album, like this falsetto funk song, it's is kind of crazy. But I liked the junk percussion aspect in the in the way that I liked it with Tom Waits. But it was Tom Waits that was the hard thing yeah. to sometimes handle on that record. And the same thing with, I mentioned um, Firewater earlier. Um, I liked a lot of that band. And sometimes it got a little like cabaret-esque. But I feel like this band utilizes the extra percussion in really interesting ways that is not so foreign that you're going to be like, this is, I mean, it gets abrasive at times, but not so much that I think maybe if you were listening to Brainiac, like Brainiac is a, an acquired taste. Brainiac's not going to appeal to 50 million people, but there are a lot of people that could definitely find something that they dig about Brainiac in all the weirdness. And I, this to me is, it's in that ballpark, but it's it's actually not quite as weird, with, yeah. which I found, you know, refreshing because I could have heard, you could hear where like this could be totally off the rails and just sound like Captain Beefheart or something like that. I mean, it could be totally yeah. experimental and whatnot, but there's a good push and pull between sort of like standard or, or conventional song structure and then let's mix it up with all of these weird percussion choices or even just like some of the miking choices with the vocals and it's just a, it's it's weird but it's a lot of fun in in its weirdness um so i i liked it quite a bit so chris what works best for you on this record so we're talking about Brainiac, and I remember one of the things that you guys said when we reviewed that album is uh, that you liked about it is how concise it was, and it was just like to the point. You know, there's no like filler in there; it's really short. And this is kind of the same way. Like I was driving over here today, and it takes about a half an hour to get to my brother's house, and it's like I popped the CD in, and it's just a little over a half an hour. It's eleven songs, and it moves really quickly, and then it's done, and that's it. It doesn't linger too long. And kind of like overstay its welcome. And um, so it's actually, it, it's kind of funny. I didn't realize it until I opened up the booklet that, um, so even though Dave Sardi produced this whole album, the track we keep talking about, the, All the Things I've Lost, was produced by Eli Janney, who also produced the Brainiac album, which I had no idea until just recently when I read the booklet, but you know, you kind of see where they were playing shows with girls against boys at the time. And yeah, it was around the time of, I think it was around the time of freak on for girls against boys. So just uh, integrating new sounds and he had a little bit of influence there. And last week in a Highland, I lost my favorite hat. I lost some things more important than that. I lost the sounds to a swirly sound ring. I like what you guys were saying about the percussion as well, because it is probably one of the most unique aspects about this band. Um, and I was just thinking about how it's going to sound like a weird comparison, but the way that you guys say that the per percussion, that kind of fills in some of the gaps and like lets it breathe. Uh, I don't know if you guys knew the, you know, that, that band Power Man 5000. Um, originally their first 
two albums. One of them was on a major, like they had a percussionist back then. Hmm. And it really reminded me of like some of the slower periods between like them being heavy. It would just have all this percussion going on and this like skeleton key, what they do here really in the same mold. And did they do a good job with that? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I just noticed the Eli Janney thing as well, which makes sense. I mean, cause that whole like New York scene with firewater and then also the DC scene are so connected in terms of, I mean, going back decades because of hardcore in the eighties and those bands always playing shows together and stuff. So it makes sense that, and I think at this point, girls against boys, like Eli Janney was in New York, I think at this point. Yeah, probably. I mean, I always pegged skeleton keep, I put always put them in this hole as like this New York art scene along with soul coughing. Got it. Okay. Like, they, I always like put those two bands together, like, oh, Soul Coughing and Skeleton Key. Like, they probably sound the same, which they do and they don't. I mean, right. <laughs> they have their own little unique thing, but isn't like they were kind of, I would say, artsier than your typical like New York bands of the time, I guess you would say. Right. They seem to be in the same artistic space as Soul Coughing, if not in the same musical space. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of pushing the percussion envelope. I mean, they had, so coughing had such a great sense of, of percussion with the upright bass and, you know, it was a super talented rhythm section in that band. Um, but it was much more driven by Mike Doty's lyrical turns where I feel like a lot of this record is driven by the music more so than the than the vocals so it's just a different approach mm -hmm. jay what um what else works for you anything else that you want to bring up well i just uh, just to reemphasize the format is also a bit of a constraint it feels like on here which was i think a good decision like the when you brought up um Brainiac being a little too much. I mean, they did a lot in the studio. I, I, I feel there's a lot of like layering and overdubbing and keyboard stuff. And like they were sort of just took full advantage of what it was in the studio. This feels like very much like they've already made the decision like, we're going to have a weird, like different format, but we're going to stick to that and try to just like play that way, which I think makes the record stay fairly easy to consume even though it's adventurous you know you sort of you can process everything that's going on it's not bringing in any radically different sounds once you kind of get comfortable with the first couple of songs what this record's going to sound like you know for the most part that format is consistent and it almost becomes like a a good constraint to work in creatively yeah that's a good point because this is i mean it's a tight record yeah there's only one song i think over four minutes on the whole record so, and these could have easily been turned into like dirges oh, for, yeah, yeah. For, for six, seven minutes. So I like that, that they kept this tight on a CD in 1997. Um, what doesn't work for you? I don't, I don't love the funk stuff. Uh, to me, it sounds like a light version of Primus. When they get into like the polyrhythms and like, that grindy bass tone where he does a lot of like popping and slide into the notes and stuff. It just, it sounds very primacy to me minus like the heaviness that primus has. Um, I think the vocal on those songs as well is not my favorite. Like it's either the weird falsetto or um, kind of monotone more spoken wordy kind of delivery. Um, I think all the things I've lost that vocal just sounds like a parody of Lenny Kravitz, which is kind of goofy. Um, so I think just when they get funky, it starts to borderline like too goofy for me. Um, and it's not quite as original. Like I start to hear, like I mentioned like, Oh, this sounds like a band doing Primus, but like with, not as heavy guitar 
Um, so it's really, for the most part, the the thing that didn't work on my end. How about you, Tim? Well, I, I feel like it really just comes down to certain songs. Like, I don't have a, a much of a problem. I don't really have any problem with the overall record, but there are like one or two songs like Vomit Ascot that yeah it's such a jolt yeah that i kind of wish you put that at the end of the record or something um to put it mid-record is not where i would do it don't have a lot of complaints i mean i like i like sort of i understand why people would be turned off by the funk aspect of it i do like that there's a little bit of like sleazy is not the right word but like big teeth as an example has like like this bluesy like um i mean it has a weightsy tom weightsy kind of feel um but i like that it has it's not grounded in 90s alternative that song Sounds much more timeless, whereas some of the other stuff that has, you know, we've mentioned the Burning Airlines sort of sound, that sounds much more relevant to that time period. But I like the fact that there is some weird, bluesy, I don't know what you would even call it's a a jazzy things going on because there's a rhythm to it. And I think if that was, if they didn't have that percussion and it was just like the guitar and the vocal, the sort of a standard percussion, it'd probably be less interesting and less engaging. And I wouldn't want to listen to it as much, but when you have the more inventive percussion stuff, and I'm not even, I need to, I didn't watch them playing live, so I need to see what it looks like. Cause I did read about, I think it's, what is his name? Is it Rick something is the um, percussionist. Sounds like he's got a whole setup going on when he's playing live, and I would like to actually check that out. But aside from like that, and I don't know, like maybe one or so other songs, like for the most part, it works really well for me. Um, because it's so dialed in and is really sticking to this weird vaudeville. I don't know, jukebox approach where it's like you hit the button and you go, okay, now it's playing a, a burning airline song. Oh, nope. Now we're playing. Now we're doing a funk song or now we're doing a blues song. Like it's weird, but somehow this approach works because of the sort of uniform percussion and, and instrumental approach to these songs. Chris, is there anything that doesn't work for you on the record? Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the single, All the Things I've Lost. Uh, I think it was... Oh, that was the single? I, I, th- I mean, that's what they played on, on the TV show, so I figured Boy. that was the single. Um, but, I mean, yeah. Wide, like, o- wide Open should have been the single. That's what I was saying. Like, that's what I was going to say is that you look at where music was in, in 97, where... Yeah, you know, like I got a lot of Primus when I listened, especially with the bass tone in this. But if they wanted to push a band like this and, you know, Primus already hit in what, 95, 96, get something on the radio, I think Wide Open would have been a lot more palatable. So I think it's like maybe a poor choice of uh, what song you wanted to push because, yeah, like that would be probably a better introductory song to the band and not set for the band and not sound so 
off the wall, I guess you would say. Um, but yeah, that's the only real problem that I have with the album. Sorry, I just pulled up their performance on Oddville just because I just wanted to see what their physical appearance looked like. Mm-hmm. And uh, yep, looks like a weird 90s band from New York City. <laughs> like one dude's wearing suspenders and the lead singer looks like he's probably doing coding in his spare time. I watched a live clip from 2011 and they look much, they just look like normal dudes now. Oh, okay. They're, but, you know. But like the percussionist has, I, I think that's maybe like the container from a gas grill with propane a bucket tank. on, yeah, propane tank with yeah. a bucket on top. Yeah. It's just like, like dudes, dude found some, some things. And it's is a, a proto slipknot, I guess you would say. Proto slipknot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And the clip I was watching, like all of his stuff continue like gets knocked around constantly because it's not a real like drum kit that's secured. So as he's hitting oh, things, okay. things are falling and he's picking them back up and <laughs> like, <laughs> I wonder how it like cuts reset. out for parts of the songs where he's like trying to get reset and it's quite a quite an experience. Well, he's got this whole thing going on when he's playing where he like hits and then he like looks away like, I'm not really. Oh, I'm going to play now. He's back (laughs) to it. I that too. I noticed that too. (laughs) It's like, I just fooled you. I'm not done. (laughs) You thought I was going to stop banging on this pan. You were wrong. You were wrong. Um, Someone needs to do an oral history of the show Oddville. I feel like that's, if it's not done, it it needs to be done because that's a, that was a weird show that we all forgot about for the most part. Um, so this comes out in 1997. I did notice on the performance, his vocal is a little less funky. Like it's a little more straightforward. I think cause the band is playing just a little bit more aggressively, excuse me, than what's on the record yeah. for all the things I've lost. So it's, it's a little bit more rock than funk, yeah. which helps. Um, probably get it into the ears of of kids but i don't understand how that as a single works when there's yeah like wide open should have been the single because i actually think that that better represents the record too i mean there's Mm -hmm. multiple songs like that yeah but who knows at capital was in i gotta imagine the a and r guy at capital who like signed the band and got the record was like um I mean, this is what I signed, but I was hoping you would write a pop song <laughs> somewhere in there. Where's your spells like Teen Spirit? We just need one of those. So a blatant rock song. Apparently, uh, um, Chris Maxwell, who's the guitarist, now makes music for the TV show Bob's Burgers. And continuing the thread of 90s alternative musicians who have gone on to work for cartoons. There's like 50 of them by now. They should probably have their own union of 90s <laughs> musicians. And then um, the, the Rick Sanko, who this mastermind of this whole thing, um, he uh, is also a puppeteer. Which makes total sense. Yeah. As far as I'm like, yes. That's what he should be doing. Also, there's still a an existent fan website that you can go to. It's not Angel Fire or Tripod. It's Skeleton D Skeleton Key dot Scumbly dot com. Oh my S C U M B L Y dot com. The un- when was the last time a band had an unofficial fan website? I miss those days, man. And then they got the cease and desist from the record label. And then people would rally around the website and, (laughs) but you can go and you can, they actually have samples of all those releases and it's really well done. There's some nice uh, JavaScript going on or, uh, or uh, whatever you call these things here. I don't know what they're called. All right, let's talk. I don't think that this had a, had a future in 97 as a, as a band that was going to be on the radio. I mean, no, but this should be like a album that's still in print and yeah, as relevant as all the bands we mentioned 
Brainiac and Burning Airlines and Sparkle Horse and like that's a good the point. Litany of like slightly odd like late nineties bands that you know had careers still can some of them still play. Um I feel like this is really lost. Maybe mainly because it's not streaming, I guess. <laughs> right. It's one big reason that it feels that way. Interestingly, this was released only on CD, but there's a double CD version with an enhanced CD. Oh no. <laughs> and it has a um a short film along with remixed versions of some of the songs, some non-album songs. Um, but yeah, if you can find yourself a, oh, so speaking of Sparkle Horse, Jay, the remixes were done by Mark Linkus of Sparkle Horse, Paige Hamilton, DJ Spooky, and JG Thurwell of That's Otis, so funny. Fetus. I'm looking at my notes for Vomit Ascot and Dear Reader, and I have highlighted like within 10 pixels of each other helmet for vomit ascot for the riff and sparkle horse for dear reader <laughs> good call guess so uh so if anybody has one of those and wants to pop it in their computer and see if that uh enhanced cd still works let us know <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that i want to just start collecting enhanced cds just specifically so i can see if they still work like I feel like that should be somebody's I can't job. Imagine, yeah. Like where where are you going to put it into? Like your computer computer has to have a uh, CD drive in it, you know. Well, that's the first <laughs> problem because I don't have a CD drive anymore. <laughs> um, I feel like I want to just go buy like an old PC from from the nineties and see if it'll fire up. There's a there's a a gadget. There's a place called Gadget Ease around the corner from us that has old computers and stereo equipment and stuff i bet they have like a windows 98 <laughs> computer in there an old pc from the 90s that sounds like the most painful saturday ever <laughs> Just waiting for oh, this will fun. be fun i'll get this thing working my god it's horrible <laughs> you'll be throwing it through a window dave Ayers. here's here's deep into the weeds dave Ayers was the a and r guy so i wonder if dave Ayers uh he also managed or was involved was is thanked as being management for Sparkle Horse on Good Morning Spider and It's a Wonderful Life and also worked with Yoko Ono, which somehow makes sense in all of this. <laughs> well, New, York's a New York art scene. Let's get to our overall ratings on this record. Were the album better EP, decent single? The Patreon community was kind of kind of split so i'm gonna be curious to see what their votes ended up being but jay where do you land on this record where are the album better ep or decent single i'm at an ep it's a strong ep and the songs that i like i think are really good i think wide open is really cool the uh only useful word to me is like a cool little diversion it's got a strong chorus it's got a quirky you know almost tom waitsy carnival music verse so that's a cool left turn. The world's most famous Undertaker um, is a good rock song. Dear Reader is a cool, like introspective, dynamic moment. And then the needle, it, uh, needle never ends. I think is again another good, good rock song. So um, to me, those are really strong, and I think they to me give the best impression of like, hey, what this band is about. Like they're a relevant '90s band like these other contemporaries but they have a really unique take on things and i think those songs bring it across well where you at tim i met a where the album um really the only song that i viscerally don't like is vomit ascot the rest of the album i dig in various degrees um i think i would rearrange the record a little bit i don't know that watch the fat man swing is the best opener for the record yeah, I agree. Kind of takes a while to get into it. Um, so I don't know that I necessarily would move wide open to number one because that kind of sets you up in a different way. 
for this record. And I feel like you need to know that there's going to be some weirdness. And that first song does not wide open, does not necessarily uh, clue you in. So it might be something like Big Teeth or Dear Reader or something to start out the record as opposed to Watch the Fast. I just wanted something a little bit more immediate to like clue, clue my brain into what the heck I was listening to. Um, huh. I didn't know you could download videos from YouTube. Apparently you can do that. Just saw this download button. I was like, I should have downloaded this album instead of playing it on YouTube over and over again and giving money to YouTube. And not the guy from uh, Skeleton Key, because I doubt he's making any money off of these uh, off of these spins. Chris, where are you at? Where the album? Better EP? So this is tough, because I voted one way and i kind of want to change it but i mean this just the album length is so short that i've got to say we're the album even if there are a couple of i wouldn't say clunkers but just songs that you're not too into that much i mean this album's what like 37 minutes or something so it's not a it's not a tough listen just pop it in and breeze through it and you're done so you guys still got to say we're the album and the patrons agreed. 63% were the album. 38%. Wait a minute. 38%, <laughs> 63%. That's 101%. What? How is what? that possible? Patreon, come on. What are you doing? I'm, I'm staring at this. I'm not high. But I know that 3 plus 8 equals 11. Right? They didn't change the math on me this time, did they? I know math has changed in the last 10 or so years, but 3 plus 8 still equals 11. So how is there 101% voting in this poll? What has happened here? We broke Patreon with all of our polls, Jay. That's what happened. We have so many polls (laughs) going on that we've actually broken the Patreon poll machine. (laughs) Anyway, we're the album 63%, better EP 38%, decent single zero. So they have sided with me and uh, Chris. Sorry, Jay. All right. That's all right. You get him next time. I can be different. I'm cool with that. Uh, Thanks to everyone who voted. Chris, thank you for bringing this record to us. I feel like this, uh, one of those records that perfectly fits in with our whole thing here, whereas I kind of knew the name of the band. The album cover's weird. I didn't know what genre it was. Just started guessing. And then it turns out it's actually a really cool record and not anything you could ever predict by looking at it. So thank you. A lot of cool connections, too. Yes. Yeah, the, you're uh, welcome, guys. Yeah, I mean, it just kind of fits in with my whole thing is like, you heard that band name so many times, but you never listened to it. It's like, okay, I'll go back and listen to it. And it's like, okay, yeah, like I see it now. Never would be like super popular but that's what the 90s are for just weird bands getting signed to major labels that never should have been there so (laughs) exactly and if you were to look at um speaking of polls if you were to look at our most recent if you don't know we are moving to a tournament style for our polls involving album suggestions and if you were to look at the most recent uh poll Let's see, the final tournament is like a mixture of stuff you might have heard, like Rancid. People probably heard Rancid. Heat Miser, not so much. I mean, maybe if you were an Elliott Smith fan. Uh, Matthew Goodband, that was one of those bands like I kind of heard about. but I think any, everybody in Canada. Everybody in Canada knows about it. It seems like knows that record, at least in our fan base. Poster Children, again, I know a lot of people that like Poster Children never actually listen to them, though. No. Um, the Doughboys, no idea. Yep. And then Sam Phillips. I know the name, but I'm probably messing it up with another Sam Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like there are five or six yeah. Sam Phillips from the music world. And I'm not sure which one this is. Like, it might be a guy who wrote songs, um, you know, in Tin Pan Alley in the 1930s. Or it could be a hip hop artist. <laughs> Like, I'm not sure which Sam Phillips. The album's called Martinis and Bikinis. 
I'm going to go with the latter on that one, not the Tin Pan Alley, Sam Phillips. But the point is, that's a wide range of music and some of it we've never heard of. And that's what we like here. And we thank all the people who suggest those records, just like we thank Chris for bringing this record to us. If you want to vote in that poll, uh, well, it's too late because by the time this airs, that poll's over. However, guess what? It's July, which means a whole new tournament. Right, Jay? That's right. Every month. Every month, a new tournament. Each week, you vote on a bunch of albums. And then the winners, the two winners of those first three polls, get put into a final winner take all poll. The poll to end all polls. And then at the end of the year, we're going to take the winner of all those winners <laughs> and we're going to sacrifice them at the edge of a volcano. And whoever survives is the ultimate <laughs> champion. The ultimate warrior. Actually, what we should do, I, we need to combine. I think the, the thing is you have to combine two ideas. So like we need to take like yeah. this podcast, but then combine it with like the floor is lava where we make 90s musicians go through a room and like, hey, there's an A&R, there's a recording contract. Can you grab it? <laughs> <laughs> Will you make it across the mosh pit of death? Just obstacles, 90s obstacles. Uh, somebody who works for Netflix talked to us about that. We'll yeah. make it. It sounds like I think we got a winner right here. <laughs> um, also want to remind folks that... Uh, Besides Patreon, which you can go to at uh, dmounion.com or digmeonunion.com to become a patron um, and get our vote in our polls. You can also get the box newsletter there every week. Two new reviews of albums from the 80s or 90s released recently, plus a new release calendar. I just updated like 20 or a dozen new records that are coming out in the next three months relevant stuff to this podcast there's so much stuff dropping in 2022 because of the last two years that like every week is like it's the it's basically the 90s again yeah <laughs> with regards to right. all these releases that are coming out like today i'm trying let me look, look at my minus the record companies minus the record companies <laughs> getting in the way of it all but today just today going through oh what's what's the new releases that are coming out soon and i should add them to our calendar Elf Power, Simple Minds, Ozzy Osbourne, Erasure, Of Montreal, Dropkick Murphys, King's X, The Alarm. Okay, that's not a dozen, but that's that's a that's yeah. a healthy chunk, and that's a wide range. And I don't even know that I got them all today, because uh, that was at like noon. There's probably okay. three or four new albums that got announced that are coming up, and um, <laughs> I just think you can listen. You can just with streaming you can listen to all of them you don't have yeah. to like make a decision on like hey i can only buy one of those which ones are going to be and then you right. buy the wrong one you're like damn it do i get the aussie uh, i have to sell this used for three dollars or do i get the king's x what do i do here <laughs> i gotta eat 12 bucks on a bad decision <laughs> 12 like 17.99 for some of these that aussie cd ain't going for 12.99 at best buy well, no i'm saying you're gonna get three or four bucks back right gotcha <laughs> uh the racket it, we, go, we got so screwed think about that we did my god how much money did we waste well and i was thinking about it today too because i got we're on a tangent off the rails here but um i ordered the tragically hips live at the roxy double album that just came out because it contains a famous uh mid-song story by lead singer gord downey called the killer well tank story where he goes on for like 10 minutes making up this story in the middle of the song and it's crazy and it's been on bootlegs for 25 years or 30 years whatever and they finally did an official release of it and i remember i like i opened up the box and it was so satisfying to get this big vinyl record and i you know opened up the gatefold and it wasn't gatefold but i, I pulled out the the liner notes that are inside and i'm like this makes cds feel so insignificant yeah like you open that CD and you get that little case and you're like kind of looking through the liner notes, but they were small, even worse on a cassette. But as and much I as I appreciated the mobility of CDs, like it I, really puts in hindsight, I, I don't, I don't get it. Like, right. It's sort of like none of the charm of vinyl and none of the convenience of streaming. 
So that's like, <laughs> that's actually kind of funny. I listened to a podcast with, uh, so I don't know if you know that Revelation Records, they're, uh, these guys are going through their catalog one every release and they're doing a podcast on it. They did one with, uh, they put out an album by a band called Kiss It Goodbye, which had some guys from Dead Guy. And the singer was like, they were talking about the vinyl version and the CD version. The singer for Kiss It Goodbye said he actually prefers the CD version because on the vinyl record, it's only a one page, like a slip thing or whatever with the lyrics on it. But with the CD booklet, it folds out and there's a whole lot more artwork in there. Huh. So, yeah, like it's not always bad with the CDs. but Right. No, I definitely liked it when you would get like the massive booklet mm -hmm. and there was like lyrics intertwined with artwork. And when it was when it was thoughtful or like intertwined, you know, like yeah. with holes punched in it and stuff. <laughs> oh, that yeah, too. There you go. Right. I, or you get me... weirdly fo folded ones that fold in weird directions. And you're like, how do I get this oh, back God. together? Yeah. yeah. You'd be freaked <laughs> out that you, you were going to fold it wrong and then you ruin the booklet. <laughs> yes, exactly. It, it, let me clarify, like. I don't mind. I like paying for music. I want to pay for music. The, the point right. I was making was like, we lived in a world where you had to buy largely buy music without ever hearing it. <laughs> and then if you ended up not liking the music you hadn't really heard or the album you hadn't really heard, you had no recourse. You couldn't return it and get your, all your money back. You, Excuse me, sir. I'd like to return this CD. I did not find it enjoyable. The choice was to sell used at a huge loss. That, yeah. that's that whole thing. So. Yeah. Like when, when the Misfits came back with the new singer, we were like, me and my brother and a friend of ours were like, dude, what if this isn't any good? Like, we can't listen to it. We're like, all right, we'll, we'll each put in five bucks. We'll buy uh, one copy of it. And if it sucks, we only lost five dollars, right. not 15 bucks each. That's smart. Yeah. But as opposed to like, then late in the 90s, you get to get a Best Buy or something. They're selling CDs for like $7.99. So you didn't feel as bad if you were taking a chance on something. Right. That would have been a great business idea in the 90s. What's Create that? Little, like co-ops where you could like all go in and buy music together. And then I guess you, public libraries, you could do that. But like, <laughs> yeah, the government you know I mean? provides that opportunity, Jay. It's called but like library. locally where like you get a group of people together and like, you know, put money together and then pick what records you were going to collectively buy and then be able to share them. Right. Why yep. don't we think of that? Uh, because we're selfish. <laughs> Jay, yeah. you can have this album on Tuesdays. I'm going to have it on Wednesdays. Chris is going to have it on Thursdays, and then we'll rotate. I, I started using, I used the library for a while in the 90s for this reason, so mm -hmm. it works. Oh, I definitely used the library in the, in the 90s. So did um, you guys, like, you remember how the stores had the headphones where you could listen to the CDs? I never did that. Did you guys ever do that? Couple times we did it, but we didn't have many stores. I don't know. I, it wasn't really till the late '90s when that became. Yeah, it was more '90s, ominous. early 2000s, and the only place that I remember doing it at was the Virgin Mega Store here in Columbus because they had like a lot of listening booths, and they were a lot of times it was tied to who was touring in your area. Okay, at that time, so you would see like. You couldn't pick that, up any CD and take it to the booth. No, right. no, no. It was new releases. And then like, here's the summer tour schedule for Columbus and the new releases that go along with that. So you could be like, oh, I didn't I've never heard this band and they're opening for so and so. Oh, cool. I'll go check them out. But it was not like, yeah, it wasn't. And it, again, I'm sure the technology didn't exist. But like, imagine if there had been a digital listening booth where you'd be oh like, my God, we could, could preview any record that was there. I literally bought the first Tesla record, Mechanical Resonance, without ever hearing the band. Just based on reading articles about them and looking at the cover art, I was like, all right, I only got a budget for one, one cassette and whatever it was every two weeks. And this is going to be it. And thank <laughs> right. God it was good because <laughs> I literally had never even heard the band. I mean, to be fair, I do that now, but it's with one to three dollar vinyl records in yeah. the like overflow section where it's like oh this klezmer uh <laughs> you know maybe that'll be interesting because it's yeah. a dollar or you know i'll always pick up like italian crooners that are a dollar because i'm like that's good dinner music 
it's good to put out on like some Perry Cuomo when you're eating some pasta. Feels feels appropriate. Um, also, what's appropriate, Jay, is uh, the box newsletter, which I've it's mentioned. Very, it's always appropriate. It's very appropriate, uh, which you can sign up for at digmeoutpodcast.com, which is also where you can go to suggest an album. And uh, it goes into our hopper, and then it ends up one, in one of these big-ass polls that we got going on. Big-ass polls. I want, a, I want a neon sign that says, big-ass polls. Whoa. Not the kind you're thinking of. Not in that na- not in your neighborhood. <laughs> not in our neighborhood. And then lastly, if you like what you heard, Apple Podcasts. It's where you go to leave some positive feedback. Is anybody less of any positive feedback recently, Jay, or has it been a desert of of ego boosting? Uh, I've been I haven't checked in a little bit. Yeah. I would be checking every day. Personally. I should Honestly, check every day. To, I need those be, little To be totally transparent, this is for we asked this for Apple's algorithm benefit because they like when they see positive reviews. It's right. not for our ego. It isn't. Oh, <laughs> okay. It's not for mine. I mean, I know you're, I have a, I have a weaker, um, uh, sense of self. I need that external. Send me the boost. Go give him a five star. I, I do. Actually, if you could just write in your review, Really enjoy the podcast because of Tim. Jay seems like he's along for the ride. Maybe a Muppet could do his as job. Long as, <laughs> as long as it's five stars, I don't care. What you five say. stars. <laughs> Jay seems disinterested while Tim does all of the heavy lifting. Five stars. And then I'll just feel better about myself. Thank you. All right. Enough of this nonsense it's just silliness now uh for jay i'm tim we're out we'll be back next week with another episode dig me out (laughs) 